So yesterday uh, we started a small, a short series uh, of essentials, and our essential message yesterday was, was a bit, a bit blunt, and maybe even a small bit negative. Uh, but I think it's imp it's an important one nonetheless, which is that in this call to become a saint, in this call to heaven, failure is a possibility. Again, it's, it sounds kind of negative, and it's it's very different to what we normally hear, but. This, this, it's important to, it's important, I think, to know that. It's important to kind of keep that in mind that failure is actually a possibility. I could actually get this wrong. That all of us, you know, we all have various calls, priests, religious, mom, dad, whatever it may be. And in those vocations, we can actually fail, you know. So not everyone, just because they have a vocation, just because they have a call to a particular role, not everyone gets it right. So failure, it's a possibility. It's a possibility in sport, it's a possibility in politics, and it's a possibility in the most important things also. Uh, that's, I think, I think it's, it's important and it's good to have a kind of a, a bit of a shake at the beginning because the danger is, is presumption of salvation. And that's, that's a huge danger and it's very, very, very widespread today that uh, all you have to do to get to heaven is, is just, just die, really. Just don't kind of kill anyone along the way and just die. But that kind of presumption, what if we're wrong? You know, when we listen to the words of Jesus himself, he says, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to perdition. And many take it. You know, so like these are Jesus' words, like that the way that looks easy, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't lead to heaven. So it's good for us, I think, to have a healthy, a healthy, be careful, a healthy mistrust of ourselves. To not think, yeah, sure, I think I, I, think I have things fairly sorted. It's good for us, it's good for us to be wary of our own weaknesses and failures, not dwell on them, not be stuck on them, uh, but to have a, a good balance between my need for God and God's infinite love and grace. Okay, so that's a recap of yesterday. Today then, uh, we want to look at so the, the call, the, in our essential series, the goal of it all, right, the goal of it all is, you can call it one of two things, right, you can call it becoming a saint or you can, get, you can call it getting to heaven because it's, they're the same thing effectively. You become a saint, you get to heaven. You get to heaven because you were a saint. So the goal of everything, the goal of everything that we're called to do here, like the ultimate end of, of the sacraments, sacramentals, all of our various devotions and consecrations and whatever, all of these things, the goal of it is, is to sanctify us, right? to make us a saint, which prepares us for heaven. So the ultimate goal of all this is heaven. And again, I think it's important to realize and, and, and to, be, to be clear in the fact that this kind of uh, goal, getting to heaven, doesn't happen by accident. Right? It's not going to happen just, you just kind of breeze away through life and get carried along by the current and find yourself in heaven. Uh, especially if the current, as we can see these days, is becoming more and more anti-God. Then the current is actually going the wrong direction, which means if you follow the current, you find yourself going that way, <laughs> right? I mean, if you look at recent polls as well as regards um, euthanasia in Ireland, it seems the majority of people in Ireland would be in favour of it. It's just that this culture of death has really taken root in society. So... If we're, going to, if we're going to become saints, if we're going to, to get to heaven, we actually have to be countercultural. Okay. Now, in order to do that, uh, I just want to, when people see me coming with big books, they get very worried. They think, gee, this is going to be a long one. I'm trying to be as brief as possible. Uh, but I want to draw from the wisdom of the saints because these aren't my ideas. Uh, this isn't uh, my theory of how to get to heaven. This is just what the, what the church teaches, you know, and various saints have summarized it in different ways, so I'm, I'm drawing from their wisdom. So John Paul II, in uh, Novo Millennio Inuente, uh, he describes uh, four, we can call them, principles for the spiritual journey. So spiritual journey implies that we are somewhere and we have to get somewhere else. I think it's a good mental image to have us on a mountain slope somewhere. I'm not sure where, I don't, we're probably not at the beginning. I think if you're watching uh, a mass like this, which isn't on a Sunday, chances are you're a little further up the slope than, than, than a lot. But look, wherever we are on that slope, it is difficult. You know, it is difficult. This climb isn't, isn't easy. Uh, it was never meant to be easy, um, but it, 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 requires, it requires effort. Okay, and uh, for some, some have boundless energy and can just run up mountain slopes. 
and for others it can be much more of a struggle. But the goal is always the same. The goal, the goal is heaven. The goal is sanctity. The goal is the top of that mountain with the Lord. Uh, so what does John Paul II say about all of this? Okay. So the goal of all of this, right, he describes it rather than sanctity or heaven, he describes it as union with God. Again, the same thing. It's union with God is heaven, which is sanctity. So just different terms for the same reality. So union with God of, of this great depth that we're called to have is totally unattainable by our own efforts. Principle number one, you can't do it on your own. Okay? So this kind of sanctity that we're called to achieve, you can't do it on your own. Totally unattainable by our own efforts. It is a gift that only God can give, and we are totally dependent on his grace for progress in the spiritual life. Yet we know also that God is eager to give this grace and bring us into deep union. So it's not like, again, God is up at the top of this mountain, or God in heaven, and he's just kind of looking passively at us struggle up along. I think he's throwing down ropes, and there's an occasional escalator, and, and, I mean, he's doing everything he can. He's encouraging us. He's giving us, I think he's, he's lobbing food down and grace and all that we need to get up. But we still have to do the walking, or some of the walking, uh, but always with his help. That's what, that's what leads us to principle number two. At the same time, our own effort is indispensable. It's principle number one, according to John Paul II, uh, it's, you, it's unattainable by your own efforts. You cannot do this on your own. At the same time, though, your effort is indispensable. You have to try. You have to do your part. The majority of the heavy lifting is done by God, but you have to do your bit. We can't just kind of sail along, as I say, just kind of expect it to, to happen. Uh, I remember Henry Shefflin, uh, a somewhat famous hurler from County Kilkenny, uh, when he was being interviewed once about All-Ireland finals, he said, you know, you win All-Irelands, with two things, heart and hurt. Heart and hurt, that you have to really, really want it. You have to want it more than the other team. You have to dig in deep, right? You have to have the heart, like when your body is wrecked and you're after taking a couple of elbows and pucks and uh, off the ball incidences and you're after getting raked by some fella's cleats and uh, you know, you're just, your body is just exhausted. You dig deep because you want it. And then hurt. You remember last year that you came this close to it and lost by a point. That is not happening again. Over my broken hurley, right? And you get stuck in, you know, heart and hurt. That's what wins all Ireland's. And I think I like thinking of things like that when it comes to, to sanctity as well and getting to heaven. Like, it's worth the blows that we take. It is worth it. I'm just after skipping ahead to the end. Whoops. So, okay, principle number one, totally unattainable by our own efforts. We need God. Principle number two, our own effort is indispensable though. While God does all the heavy lifting, you still have to work with him. Don't be passive. Number three, uh, he says much has to change in us. Okay, so this need for conversion, that's what we'll be looking into tomorrow. Letting go of sin, letting go of habits uh, that, that draw us away from him. Like much has to change, but that's okay. But, but no, no one's being condemned here. We'd rather change now while we can than be stuck forever with no desire to change anymore. Change now while we can. So much has to change. And that, that's fine. We have time. We have time. Kind of. We have a limited amount of time. <laughs> so it starts today. It starts, but like we do, that's why, that's why we have this life. I'm not saying be complacent. I mean, it starts today, yes, but get stuck in. Get stuck in and start now. Okay. Uh, again, we'll look into that, into that aspect in more detail tomorrow. And finally, number Principle number four from John Paul II, from Nova Millennio Innuente, he says, the effort is infinitely worth it. Infinitely worth it. So we need God. We also need to get stuck in ourselves. Point number three, uh, much has to change. So we do have to work on ourselves to become saints. But four, it's infinitely worth it. Infinitely worth it. And just to, to remind us of kind of what we're being called to, in this wonderful book, uh, The Fulfillment of All Desire by Ralph Martin, um, he outlines the wisdom of a number of the saints, which, which he synthesizes into these three stages of the spiritual journey. Okay? So the first is the purgative stage. 
a way which includes initial phases of the spiritual life, including coming to conversion, turning away from sin, bringing one's life into conformity with the moral law, initiating the habit of prayer, practices of piety, and maintaining a relatively stable life in the church. Okay, it's purgative stage, stage number one of three. Now, when you hear that, you go, that sounds, sounds pretty good. I think I've done some or a lot of that. But the whole point is it doesn't stop there. That's the whole point. Like often we'd be happy to stop the sounds. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'd be okay with that. Okay. Level number two, all right, the illuminative stage is one of continuing growth. It's characterized by deeper prayer. So again, it's not, it's not, it's not more prayer, but it's prayer that becomes a, a real encounter with the Lord. It's, it's an interior life. Deeper prayer. Growth in the virtues, deepening of love of neighbor, greater moral stability, and complete Surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Greater detachment from all that is not God. Okay, it may be accompanied by various trials and purifications. Okay, that's stage number two. That's the one that kind of maybe gets us a small bit worried. Trials and purifications and oh, doesn't sound fun anymore. But it doesn't stop there. Right? Stage number three on the spiritual journey. The unitive stage is one of deep, habitual union with God, characterized by deep joy, profound humility, freedom from fears of suffering. Freedom from fears of suffering. You're not afraid of it anymore, like you can think of the martyrs. Great desire to serve God. Suffering now becomes preliminary, primarily the grace of sharing in the redeeming suffering of Christ rather than the suffering of purification. It's where we enter into a spiritual marriage or a transforming union with God. Okay, that's the, the third stage <clears throat> on the spiritual journey. So you can see what we're called to isn't uh, any form of a kind of a spiritual minimalism. Uh, it was something I was thinking about this morning as well. It, it's, it's very important that, that we, we use all the graces that God gives us. But I think at times there can maybe be a tendency to always try and find a shortcut, you know? Like devotions to the first Friday, first Saturday, consecration to Our Lady, uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet, um, and all the kind of thing are absolutely wonderful and powerful means uh, to, to uh, re receiving God's grace, absolutely. But at times, I think a kind of an attitude, a mentality can skip in, what's, can slip in, what's the minimum I have to do to be saved? You know, if I do these devotions, am I sorted? You know, and kind of rather than, because I love the Lord, I want to give him everything. So I don't, I, like, imagine applying the same idea like to a, you know, a husband and wife. What's the minimum I have to do for my wife to love me or that, that, that she'll be happy with me? What's the minimum I have to do? Well, I mean, if I take her out once a month and buy her earrings or some grant, okay, we'll do that. Even though, like, you're ticking the right boxes, the attitude is a bit, should that be it? Like, find, identify the minimum I have to do to please the wife and do that. Identify the minimum I have to do to please God and do that. It's just, it's, it's not an attitude of love. It's not, an attitude of love wants to give and give in super abundance. You know, when people are in love, they do stupid things like buying flowers that last two days. What's the point of that? But it's, it's just an expression of love, you know? I don't know, I don't know why people like flowers, whatever. Overrated. Uh, but it's, just, it's, it, 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 that's kind of, it's almost the point of it. You buy something that's really stupid expensive and uh, only lasts a couple of days just to say you love them. That's, that's it. Do you know, like, but there's no practical reason, there's no practical purpose to it at all. Just, it's a kind of an almost wasteful way of saying I love you. And, and it works. <laughs> because it shows love. Because so, that's not a minimum thing. So I think this is, this is really important. Like when, when we're talking about this spiritual journey, uh, it's not about giving God the minimum, but giving God everything. Now, finally, and I've probably gone over time, uh, in this spiritual journey, this is the whole point of Essentials Part 2 today, in the spiritual journey, we have a guide. And that guide is Our Lady. Our Lady is, is the one who perfectly collaborated with the grace of God. So if we think of John Paul II's points like that we need God's grace, right? This, this, this transformation uh, requ requires God's grace. We can't do it on our own. That's Our Lady, immaculately conceived, who collaborates perfectly with God's grace. Part two, we have to do our bit. 
Our Lady in every choice in, in, her, in her life, uh, from the Lord's conception and, on, until uh, standing at the foot of the cross and then with the apostles afterwards when the New Testament as such was being written, Our Lady there amongst the apostles, in every aspect, until her, her assumption, she co-works perfectly with the Lord's grace. Okay, John Paul II's third point, that much has to change, not so much in her. She was fairly okay that way. Uh, she, you know, not sinning is, is an advantage. It's, that's, definitely, that's definitely helpful. Uh, so, but, but she, so she's our guide. She's our guide. In, then John Paul II's fourth point, it's infinitely worth it. Our Lady would not disagree. In all of this, this confusion and uh, so many opinions and so many voices and now with access to social media, just so much information, uh, you can convince yourself of anything because there'll be enough sources and studies out there to back up your point on any side. And it just becomes very, very confusing to know what's the truth here anymore? Or what am I supposed to do? Or even if I know all of this, good, what am I supposed to do with my actual life and choices? Stay close to Our Lady. Stay close to Our Lady. She is our guide. All, uh, anybody who tries to scale Mount Everest, no matter how well trained they are, no matter how many times they've done Kilimanjaro or other very high peaks, when you climb Everest, you always go with an experienced guide, no matter how good you think you are. You always go with a guide, someone who knows the mountain, someone who can read the winds, someone who can read the weather, someone who, who knows the terrain, knows where the, the cracks are. You always go with a guide. As we ascend towards heaven, as we scale this difficult mountain, and it is difficult, we follow Our Lady's example, we follow Our Lady's hand. She will show us the way to her Son, and her Son will lead us to the heart of our Father. Jesus himself tells us, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world.